When you think about who was the greatest MMA fighter in the 90s, Frank Shamrock is a name that has to come to mind. The man who became the first ever UFC light heavyweight champion successfully defended that belt four times before leaving the promotion to retire at the age of 26. But instead he came back and won belts in the WEC and Strike Force. Yet for some reason his legacy in the sport hasn't been recognized by many. So how good was Frank Shamrock actually? Hey guys it's Keon and today we're going to talk about Frank Alicio Juarez III, who was better known as Frank Shamrock. He's the adopted brother of Ken Shamrock, an MMA icon back in the day. So when Frank became pro, he was already popular by name, but that name also came with a lot of pressure to succeed. So in this video we're going to take a look at Frank's career to see if he did just that. Before we get to it, as always shout out to the undisputed members of my Patreon. Join now and get early access to my YouTube videos as well as a shout out before each one. You will also get access to Patreon only content, which includes video to the Keon Kamara podcast, a podcast that you could also listen to for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. Now let's get to it. Frank Shamrock made his MMA debut on December 16th, 1994. He trained with Ken and his team, the Lions Den, prior to entering the King of Pancrase opening round tournament. Like I say for every video with a Pancrase fight, the main rules that differ from MMA were no closed fisted punches to the head and rope grabs to break up submissions. His first fight was against Boss Rutin, which is absolutely nuts considering how much more experience Boss had at this point in comparison to Frank. But surprisingly, the fight was competitive as Frank secured multiple takedowns and maintained top position, while Boss reversed him a few times while off his back. He also attempted an array of submissions, but Frank was able to escape all of them. The fight was close, but Frank did enough to win by decision. In the second round that same evening, he fought Manabu Yamada. It was a competitive fight on the ground that saw reversals and submission attempts from both men and close to the end of the fight, they both got a hold of the other's leg. But it was Manabu's Achilles lock that forced Frank to tap. A month later, he came back and fought Katsuomi and Inagaki. This was a dominant performance by Frank who secured a few submissions early to force Inagaki to grab the ropes. The fight ended with a rear naked choke that forced Inagaki to tap. In March of 95, Frank fought Masakatsu Funaki. Although Frank managed to secure takedowns and maintain top position for most of the fight, Funaki was able to lock up a triangle choke that forced a rope grab before securing a toehold that made Frank tap. A month later, he fought Minoru Suzuki. The two were scrambling for dominant position to start off the fight before Frank got a hold of Minoru's back and locked in the rear naked choke that forced a tap. Following this win, he fought Alon Goez. It was a competitive fight that saw both men throw strikes to the head on each other while on the ground, which is completely legal but discouraged by fans. And Alon was also eye gouging Frank but the ref didn't see it. He also secured a rear naked choke that forced a rope grab and in the process, he received a yellow card for holding on the choke for too long. But Frank returned the favor when he locked up a heel hook which broke Alon's leg. It was a very close fight that was ruled as a draw. Frank came back in June to fight Takaku Fuke. The fight was closely contested as both men reversed each other and attempted submissions. But Frank managed to get a hold of Fuke's back and lock in the rear naked choke. A month later, he fought Boss Rutin for a second time. Frank secured multiple takedowns, maintained top control and attempted a few submissions. Boss reversed the position a few times and was definitely the aggressor on the ground as he almost locked up a few submissions as well. Overall, I think Frank did enough to win but the split decision victory ended up going to Boss. Two months after this loss, Frank fought Takafumi Ito. He secured two rear naked chokes in this fight with the first one taking away a point from Takafumi and the second one forcing the tap. His next fight was a rematch against Masakatsu Funaki. The two swung with wild shots to begin this fight before Frank secured the takedown and put Funaki in a headlock that forced him to rope grab. But he retaliated with an arm bar and a toe hold that forced Frank to grab the rope twice. The final sequence saw both men attempting toe holds, but it was Frank's that forced Funaki to tap. Frank would later say that he believes Funaki took a dive in order to build his popularity. For his ninth and final fight of 1995, Frank fought Vernon White. Frank ended the fight with an Achilles lock that forced the tap. His next fight was for the interim King of Pancrase title. It was against Minoru Suzuki who he beat in their first matchup. But this time Minoru was the aggressor for most of the fight as he landed kicks, secured takedowns, maintained top position, and attempted submissions. Even when Frank answered back with offense, Minoru would counter successfully. Had the fight gone to the judges, he definitely would have won. But Frank managed to get on top and spin around for a knee bar that forced the tap. He became the interim King of Pancrase. Before he unified the belt against the King of Pancrase, Boss Rutin, Frank beat Ryushi Yanagasawa and Osami Shibuya by decision. In both fights, he was the aggressor, with the Shibuya fight being a little more competitive. But overall, he took both men to the ground, attempted submissions, and secured some as well. He was also pretty good with his striking as he threw kicks and knees at ease, palm strikes at quick speeds, and was never afraid to go toe to toe with his opponent. And a lot of this he learned through former UFC heavyweight champion Maurice Smith. He finally fought Boss Rutin in May of 96, making it their third and final meeting. And this one was the wildest. 
Frank took Boz down early with a beautiful suplex. And aside from talking trash while on top position, Frank also began throwing open palm strikes to the head of Boss, which of course is discouraged while on the ground. But Boss retaliated with palm strikes to the head as well. When the two got back up to the feet, they traded kicks before Boss knocked Frank down. Frank got back up and shot for a takedown that led to both men falling out of the ring. He also avoided a knee from Boss by somersaulting backwards. But one of the most famous moments in MMA history was when Frank began taunting Boss in a leg lock exchange. This caused Boss to connect with a close fisted punch to Frank's head, which is illegal and led to a red card. Regardless, the fight ended after Frank took a knee to the face while he attempted a takedown. This led to a cut on his eye which forced the doctor to stop the fight. After this loss, Frank fought Manabu Yamada for a second time. Frank was the aggressor on the ground for most of it by securing four rear naked chokes with the fourth one forcing the tap. A month later, he fought Yuki Kondo. Although Frank was the aggressor immediately by taking the fight to the ground and maintaining top position, once it got back up, it was all Yuki Kondo who began connecting with heavy shots that dropped Frank a couple of times. The fight eventually ended with a head kick that knocked Frank out of the ring. If this happened during the social media age, it would have been huge. Following this loss, Frank fought Kiyoma Kunioku. It was a competitive back and forth fight with lots of reversals and submission attempts from both men. The fight was also closely contested on the feet with Kiyoma connecting with some shots that hurt Frank. After 20 minutes, Kiyoma did enough to win by decision. This also turned out to be Frank's last fight with Pancrase after the company fired him in retaliation to Ken Shamrock leaving the organization due to a dispute with management. His first fight after Pancrase was against John Lober in Hawaii's Super Brawl 3 event. After starting off the fight aggressively by taking it down, attempting submissions with one of them being a leg lock that broke Lober's ankle and strikes that knocked out his front teeth. Frank gassed out and the momentum began to shift in favor of Lober who was now picking him apart on the feet and controlling him on the ground. This was enough for Lober to win the fight by split decision. Following these three losses, Frank fought in Japanese promotion, Rings. His opponent was Suyoshi Kosaka. It was a competitive fight that saw Kosaka secure takedowns and maintain top position while Frank was picking him apart on the feet. After 30 minutes, Frank won the fight by decision. A month later, he fought Wes Gassaway. Frank locked up a Kimura and two rear naked chokes that forced three rope escapes by Wes, leading to a victory for Frank. His next fight was against Ensign Inoue at Valet Tudo Japan 1997. After Frank dominated round one by taking the fight down and throwing ground and pound, he found himself mounted early round two after a failed takedown attempt. But when the two got back up, they got in a crazy exchange that saw them swinging wildly. Then while in the clinch, Frank connected with punches and knees that knocked Ensign out cold, making it the first win in his career to finish by strikes. Frank would later say that this was the toughest fight of his career. After winning three in a row, he joined the UFC and fought Olympic gold medalist in wrestling and UFC 14 middleweight tournament winner, Kevin Jackson. The fight was to determine the inaugural UFC light heavyweight champion, but at this time, the light heavyweight division was known as middleweight. Kevin, who was the betting favorite, secured the takedown early, but Frank locked in the armbar off his back that forced an immediate tap at the 16 second mark, making him the first UFC light heavyweight champion. Shortly after this win, Frank finally left the lion's den after years of feuding with Ken who told him that he didn't have what it took to be a champion so he was better off running the gyms. What made this even worse was when their dad chose Ken's side by telling Frank he could no longer continue their relationship until he makes amends with Ken. So it's understandable why he deserted the team after winning the belt. This led to Frank and Ken cutting all ties with each other for more than 15 years. His first title defense was against the undefeated Igor Zinoviev. This fight lasted 6 seconds longer than Frank's last one, but it was still a victory as he lifted Igor in the air before slamming him to the mat and knocking him out in the process. Not only did Igor break his collarbone and fracture his C5 vertebrae, but he was also forced to retire immediately from MMA. At UFC 17, Frank fought Jeremy Horn. Jeremy was a younger and bigger fighter, and for most of the fight, he was winning by taking Frank down and maintaining top position. Frank did reverse Jeremy a few times and also had him in a tight guillotine choke at one point. If the fight went to the judges, Jeremy most likely would have won, but instead Frank stole the win by securing a knee bar that forced a tap. Five months later, he fought John Lober for a second time. In contrast to their first fight, it was John who was the aggressor early by securing takedowns and attempting submissions. But Frank managed to reverse the position, almost locked in two guillotine chokes, and was the overall aggressor on the feet. And now in this fight, it was John who was beginning to fade while Frank was fresh and coming forward with strikes. He eventually ended the fight on top of John who tapped to the continuous pressure. After going back to Japan where he fought to a draw against Kiyoshi Tamura, Frank was set to defend his belt for a fourth time against rising light heavyweight Tito Ortiz who was a longtime rival to Frank's former team, the Lion's Den. It was the UFC's most anticipated fight since Hoist Gracie vs Ken Shamrock. Although Tito was the less experienced fighter, Fighter, he was seen as the new face of MMA and was a favor going into this fight, especially considering he had the size advantage. And he lived up to those betting odds as he was dominating the fight for the first three and a half rounds with takedowns and ground and pound. Even though Frank was connecting with some nice kicks, it wasn't enough, until the final minute of the fourth round when he reversed Tito and began throwing a bunch of shots that were all connecting. This forced Tito to shoot for a desperation takedown that
that led to a reversal by Frank who finished the fight with Hammer Fist. It was also Frank's final title defense as he decided to retire at the age of 26, thus relinquishing his belt and becoming a commentator and consultant for the UFC. But his retirement was short-lived as he came back a year later to fight Elvis Sinosik at a K1 event in Japan. It was an impressive performance by Frank who took Elvis down every round, attempted submissions, and was the overall aggressor on the feet. He won the fight by split decision which should have been unanimous in my opinion. After taking a two and a half year long layoff, Frank came back and fought Brian Pardo for the inaugural WEC Light Heavyweight Championship. Although Brian was a bigger fighter and managed to take the fight down early and throw some ground and pound, Frank secured an armbar while off his back that forced the tap. The fight lasted less than two minutes. Following this win, he came back three years later to fight Caesar Gracie in the first ever Strike Force event. Although Caesar had elite level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and trained the likes of Nick and Nate Diaz, he had zero fight experience in MMA. So it came to no surprise when Frank knocked him out in 20 seconds with a huge right hand. But still impressive considering how infrequent he was fighting these days. Following this event, he fought Henzo Gracie in the first ever Elite XC event. Although Henzo secured multiple takedowns throughout this fight, Frank was connecting more on the feet. But while on his back, he threw a couple of illegal knees to Henzo's head. After 5 minutes of recovery time, Henzo was unable to continue which handed Frank the loss by disqualification, making it his first loss in 10 years. After this, he came back 4 months later to fight Phil Baroni for the inaugural Strike Force Middleweight Championship. The two shared a lot of trash talk prior to the fight and during it. Just to clarify, the Strike Force Middleweight division was at 185 pounds. And from the start, that animosity translated into wild exchanges that knocked Phil down early and the fight looked moments away from ending. But Phil survived and also secured a takedown. Yet Frank was the fresher fighter and when the fight got back up, he continued picking Phil apart. And that momentum continued for Frank in the second round as his strikes kept connecting. But Phil also gave everything he had left in the gas tank and was able to land some shots as well. Making it a war before Frank's striking was too much that it forced Phil to shoot for a takedown. This led to his back being taken before going to sleep via rear naked choke. Making Frank the first ever strike force middleweight champion. His first title defense was against Kung Lee. For most of the first round, the fight was on the feet and it was Kung Lee who was winning most of the exchanges with the help of his kickboxing expertise. Near the end of the third, Frank did have him hurt for a moment and that would have been his chance to win the fight. But Kung Lee recovered and before the start of the fourth, Frank was unable to continue due to a broken arm from a kick, making Kung Lee the new Strike Force middleweight champion. In early 2009, there were talks of Frank fighting his brother Ken, but he would later retract the idea as he said he didn't want to beat up an old man. Yet I do wonder what the outcome would have been if these two fought in their primes. Anyways, Frank's next fight was in April and it was against former WEC welterweight champion Nick Diaz. It was at a catchweight of 179 pounds. But oddly enough, it was Nick who was the bigger fighter. And with his skill, he was able to pick apart Frank on the feet and on the ground. The fight eventually ended in the second round when Nick connected with a body shot followed by ground and pound that forced Big John to step in. It was a passing of the torch moment between the two fighters. And Frank knew it. Which is why on June 26, 2010, at the age of 37, he retired from MMA competition. So after going 23, 10, and 2 in a career that saw him become the first UFC light heavyweight champion, the first WEC light heavyweight heavyweight champion, the first strike force middleweight champion, and the interim king of paint race? How good was Frank Shamrock actually? First off, he had a lot to live up to when he entered the sport considering that Ken Shamrock established himself as one of the world's best fighters at this point. But instead of remaining in the shadows of his brother, he had himself a career filled with many accolades but more importantly, a career that was very influential on the evolution of MMA. As much as his style focused on shoot wrestling, he also trained hard in improving his striking and other fight characteristics like stamina and athleticism. And because of this, he was one of the first fighters to be considered well-rounded. Which was rare at the time because fighters stuck with their strengths and didn't care to train another styles of fighting. He essentially raised the bar on what it took to be the best in the world. And this led to generations of fighters training to become dangerous in all aspects of fighting. So it comes to no shock when I say that Frank has a high fight IQ. And I think he displayed that the best by retiring from the sport at the right time. Because not only do smart fighters analyze their fights very well, but they're also good at analyzing the landscape of the sport and where they fit in it. So that's why I have to give credit to Frank for accepting that there was a new age of talent coming up and he wasn't going to be the best among them. And that's understandable considering his age and the amount of wear and tear on his body over the years. But by making this decision, he saved himself from tarnishing his legacy, which is something that is very easy to do in this sport. So I'm going to give Frank's MMA career a 9 out of 10. I'd also like to add that Frank was the smaller fighter in most of his matchups. He's also the reason why Strike Force became successful and that led to the signings of some of the world's best fighters. It's a shame that his peak happened during a time when the sport was not that popular. And I also don't like how he hasn't been inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame due to his strained relationship with the promotion. In fact, Frank not being included 
included there is a huge reason I don't take it very seriously. Don't get me wrong, there are some amazing fighters in the Hall of Fame. But if a fighter like Frank is not on it because he's not liked by upper management, who says that's not going to happen again with another fighter? Regardless, he doesn't need that accolade for people to know how legendary he is. He is someone that could have been remembered as a brother of a great. But instead, Frank Shamrock became one himself. My name is Keon and this is my take on how good Frank Shamrock actually was. Do you agree, disagree, or have something else to add? Please put it in the comments down below because I love to read it. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. But that's all I have for now, so I'll see you on my next one.